We're in a three-week series called um, Undefiled. Um, Noel came last week and spoke on the first portion of this message, and if you were here, you realize that last week's message was incredibly challenging. Um, we've had um, a lot of discussions that have happened since last Sunday's sermon of we didn't realize how bad it is out there or how um, corrupt um, this whole sex trafficking industry is and how huge it is. And so it was uncomfortable to hear some of the stats and stories and um, testimonies of people. And yet it, we live in a broken world and this is where God has called us to live and this is where God has called us to live lives of purity but also to live lives where we fight injustice and pray against the darkness, the powers of darkness. And so this morning, we continue that series, um, but we make it a little bit more personal. We bring it home this morning. And so if you're a parent in this room, you probably sensed how much television sells sex, even on children's television channels, like Disney Channel. You would expect Disney Channel to be like when we grew up about Smurfs, and G.I. Joe, and um, um, Cabbage Patch Kids, and stuff like that, right? I mean, I'm probably dating myself because some of you guys are like, Cabbage Patch Kids, G.I. Joe, what is that? And so, um, but it's not. You turn on Disney Junior and Disney Channel, and they're selling sex and dating and relationships to kids under the age of 12. They're selling it at a very young age. And sadly, the kids buy into it. They want to buy clothes to make sure make them look pretty or makes guy boys attractive toward them. Um, they, they are all about talking about sexual content stuff because we joke about it. It's common on television. The reality is that these television channels market sex to little kids because these kids are sexual beings even at a young age. But they're made in the image of God and they bear his image. And that's something that this morning we have to get our minds wrapped around. We need to think rightly about sex. The Bible talks about sex from cover to cover. And in the very first chapter of Genesis, the Bible says that God created us male and female. That's the beginning of sex. We talk about sex, and when I mention that word, our minds go off into various different topics. And it feels weird to talk about this topic, especially in the context of church. Because what we're thinking about is the action or the activity or the intimacy. We're thinking about the things that we saw on television last night or the movie that we recently saw or the images that we see online. That's where our mind goes. But our mind has to start with sex is God's image that we uniquely bear as male and female. When you're filling out a job application and it says sex, your mind doesn't go and wander off um, an image that you saw. You think about male or female and you check off what you are. That's how we have to think about this subject. We are sexual beings. Last week, Noah began our series and looked at the topic of sex trafficking. I think he hit it right on the mark when he said that we aren't doing this so that we can focus on an issue and say, oh, let's be sad or let's go out and do something about it or let's go on a mission trip and go into the brothels and rescue women out of the streets. The reason we're doing this series is that we can see what God says about this because the Bible has a lot to say about this topic and because then, then figure out how does that form us and then how does that drive our response to this topic. This week we're going to dig a little deeper and it's going to hit a lot closer to home. We're going to look at how a pornified society with pornified content and attitudes and behaviors and culture affect us and how we pursue a pure and undefiled life in the midst of that, even if we've already been harmed by it, even if we've already been wounded by it. How do we pursue the purity of Jesus? That's what we'll be looking at this morning. And in this sermon, we're going to look at how do we pursue a life of purity in which we will behold God's glory and, his un and with unveiled faces, and that God will unveil us to the world as his beloved sons and daughters of the one true God. So if you have your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 6, 12 to 20 is our text. And this is Paul writing to the church in Corinth, and read with me, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? 
Shall I then take the member of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. For he who has joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin is a person every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Pray with me. Father, as we read this scripture this morning, I pray that our hearts would be open and receptive to hearing your voice. God, there, these are issues that are going to hit home. And so will your Holy Spirit bring healing where healing needs to happen? Will your Holy Spirit bring conviction where conviction needs to happen? And would you remind us at the end of the day that you are for us, that you are working in us, that you have never stopped working in our lives? And so, God, we give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple things about our text. Paul is writing to a church in the city of Corinth. It's a new church. It's a growing church. The church is exploding. Corinth is a very interesting city. It's a wealthy city. It's in the Roman Empire. It's a Greek city. It has a large port so that it's important for trade routes. And because of that, it has acquired a lot of wealth. It's acquired a lot of commerce. And it's acquired a lot of entertainment, especially sexual entertainment. This was part of the Greco-Roman culture. In Corinth, there was a temple to the goddess Aphrodite, who was the goddess of love, beauty, and pleasure. According to history, there was estimated there were probably several thousand prostitutes in the temple every single day that were, there to, that were there to serve the people that would come in. They had people coming in from all parts of the world. There was a saying in that time that basically said that it wasn't right for every man to visit Corinth. The reason was you were going to lose your money because it was a city for eating, drinking, and being merry. And it left a lot of people ruined. A lot of people became wealthy because of the wickedness that was happening in the city. It's a beautiful city. It's an important city. And Paul goes there to start a church. Let me pause there and say that there's a lot of relevance between Corinth and Dallas. We live in a major city. There are people here from every corner of the world. This week, the mayor of Dallas at a conference of the church um, downtown mentioned that there are 239 languages that are spoken in our metroplex right now. 239 languages. We've got people coming from everywhere. It's a major city. It's a city that's full of sexual sin. You can't drive down a highway in this city without seeing billboards promoting sex clubs or strip clubs or whatever. Paul's speaking to us in this passage. He's speaking to us in the city of Dallas. And he's saying, here's how you live as a follower of Jesus who is pursuing his purity and his life, the way that he's created for us in the midst of a sexualized and exploited environment that is seeking to break down that image of God that you uniquely bear. And there are two main points that Paul talks about in this text. Number one, he says that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's interesting because what we see in Greek culture and what we even see in our culture today is that your body doesn't matter at all. Your body doesn't matter. What you do is whether you're a good person or not, but what you do with your body doesn't matter. So drink, eat, be merry, have fun, enjoy the people around you. Paul says something that's so countercultural to them. And he says, listen, your body is the temple of God. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And for Jewish believers that were hearing this, their mind immediately goes back to the temple in Jerusalem. And so the temple in Jerusalem is where God resides. It was a sacred place. It was a holy place. And Paul is making a point. He's saying, just as God would reside in the temple in Jerusalem, the temple needed to be cared for. The temple needed to be sanctified. The temple needed to be cleansed. It had to be prepared to receive the presence of God, a tabernacle for God. In the same way, your body matters. What you do with your physical body is important. The text talks about sex and money and food, and what you do with it is essential to what you are being called to do and what God has given you to steward. Your body is the temple of God. 
That includes your physical body. It also includes your mind and your emotion. That's why Paul will later write in Romans, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because this is God's will for us, that we be sanctified, that we be set apart. Your body is a temple. The second thing that Paul says here in this text is flee from sexual immorality. He makes it very simple in that statement. He doesn't give us any dabble room. He doesn't say, here's some boundaries and some stuff that you can mess with. He says flee. Recognize where life is and where death begins and flee from there. Run. Don't dabble with it. And remember, he's talking to a culture that's embedded in this. It was normal. It was accepted for a man in that culture to go and visit a temple prostitute. This was part of society. But Paul's saying you're called to something so much more. How can you do that when God's metaphor for sex is that God is our husband, that he is one with us, and he wants us to be one with him, single-minded, single-focused, then how can you give your bodies away to many people when God wants you all for himself? That's the whole purpose of sexual union. That's why in Genesis 2, he says, they they become one body. Flee from sexual immorality. I want to take a side note and say, notice what he said, flee. That's important. There are three ways that we deal with sin in our lives. There are some sins that we're called to fight. We fight against injustice. We fight against abuse. We fight against poverty. Some sins that we encounter, we're called to take up our weapons and we fight because that's what we're called to do. We resist. These are sins that we fight because God hates injustice. Yet there are also some sins that we're called to resist. We resist the urge to make a name for ourselves at the expense of other people. We resist pride and jealousy and those internal sins that no one sees but us. We resist those kinds of sins. Listen, there's also some sins that you just have to flee from. You run away from it. You flee from sexual immorality. And we need to be very mindful of how we deal with sins. You don't flee when injustice is being done. You fight because we model a God who hates injustice. At the same time, you don't sit and fight sexual immorality when you're tempted. You flee from it. In other words, when you're presented with filth in front of you, you don't close your eyes or look at the screen and pray that God will remove it. You turn the computer off and you run from it. You don't sit there and hope that it just disappears supernaturally. There are some things you just have to say, I don't want to be a part of. You flee from that. You shut it off. You flee. Flee from sexual immorality. And I want to tie this to our environment where we live. We can all agree that we live in a pornified society. The influence of the porn industry has trickled down into every area of our lives. It's not that we have nudity or suggestive acts on TV and film. The attitudes of sexual, of commercial sex and pornography are everywhere. Sex is used to sell everything from cars all the way to deodorant. That's what it's used to promote. This has become normal for us. Next weekend is Super Bowl Sunday. Watch, pay attention to the commercials that are being advertised that they pay millions of dollars to put on and see how many of them use sex appeal to make us feel like we need to purchase their product. This is the world that we live in. The passage that we read says a lot about pornography. If you read the text, it doesn't mention pornography at all. Noel pointed out this last week, but Paul uses a couple words in this text when he talks about sexual immorality and prostitution. The first word is porneia, which is a Greek word for sexual immorality or sexual sin. And he uses that several times, flee porneia. Then he connects that to prostitution and how they are connected and integrated into that society. He says that you cannot join yourself to a prostituted person, porne. This is where we get the word pornography from, porneia, and then another Greek word called graphos. Porne, graphos, pornography. The word literally means the depiction 
of prostitution. That is what pornography is. That's important because we live in a society in which everything has been normalized. And the porn industry has won the minds and hearts of our culture over the last 20, 30 years. We can't attack it because it's protected under the First Amendment. And if you don't like it, just don't watch it. But you can't stop it from being produced. It's just sex. Nothing more than that. But here's the point. It's not about sex for art. Pornography is about a specific text, sex. It's commercial sex, which is corrosive and contrary to God's plans because it breaks down everyone who touches it. So we have in this passage six different references to porn, porneia and porne. Can I say that's probably more in those several verses than we probably hear in most churches around us, Paul is saying that we have to be serious. We've got to have a come-to-Jesus conversation, and we're going to talk about the issue of porn. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to know. And here's this vision that, vision that goes so much beyond this. Here's the vision that will take us to the next level. Paul is being incredibly bold here. He's calling people out in this letter. He specifically says, some of you guys are engaged in things that aren't even worth mentioning. They aren't even fit to mention. He calls them out. And the reason he does this is because he loves them. He says, if I don't talk to you about this, it actually demonstrates to you that I don't love you. And I don't care about this issue that you're facing. This is what you're facing when you're walking down the street to your jobs. This is what you're facing when you're headed to work. This is what you're facing when you're headed to your neighbors. This is what you're facing even when you're headed toward worship gatherings. Sex is commercialized everywhere. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is the issue of porn. This is our world. Fast forward 2,000 years, and we're dealing with the same issues that Corinth was dealing with. The stuff is in our face now. It's easily accessible now. Except now you don't have to go to the bad part of town or go to a temple to get it. It's right here on our screens. The temple has been brought into our homes and into our hands. Every manner of self-worship, idolatry, and of sexual gratification is right here in our hands. All the more reasons that we need to dive into Scripture, hear what Paul and God and the Holy Spirit is saying to us right now because it's relevant We live in a culture just like Corinth. The most recent surveys say that 50% of us men in this room are struggling with internet pornography right now. 50%. That makes sense to me because we're sexual beings. We're wired to be curious and drawn there, and now we have something that is created to draw us in. It's coming after you. It's seducing you. One out of every two of us, guys, we're struggling with this. This is why this is relevant. More and more Christian women are struggling with this. It's more accessible now than ever before, and everyone on television is saying it's okay. 20%. One out of five women in the church are struggling with this. And I'm not giving you these stats for us to condemn one another, but so that we can come out together and talk about these issues And fight it. Because when we come out, we're breaking the power of the secret. Breaking the power of secrets in our lives. That's where the enemy gets traction. That's where he comes against us. But when we're honest and say, I'm struggling, we get help, we get prayer. And the enemy loses that traction. And it's not just something that's affecting you guys out there. Stats say that 30% of pastors are struggling with sexual sin, including internet pornography. We're all broken. And so God's speaking to us. And the thing that breaks our heart most is our kids. Studies say that 52% of boys before the age of 12 will be exposed to digital porn. One out of every two boys before the age of 12 will see porn before they even turn a teenager. 
32% of females will see porn before the age of 12. This is the first generation that's growing up that basically has access to this junk anytime they want it, and they're being exposed to it. This is why this topic is so relevant. This is why we're dealing with it, because there is no bubble that we can create. This affects people in churches. It affects Christian schools. It affects ministries. It affects God-fearing homes. This is our reality. This is why we're talking about it, to attack it and to live pure in the midst of it. We have to understand what's going on. So our series is about sex trafficking and the injustice that's going on. So how is all of this connected together? How is this connected to what Noel talked about last week, about the injustice that's going on in the world? Because it sounds like two completely different issues. Sex trafficking is about women and children that are being forced and kidnapped and put into brothels. Porn is about women who want to do this and get rich and famous by being on your computer screens. How are they connected? Let me give you a couple of reasons. Before that, human trafficking, I think Noel mentioned this last week, is a $32 billion industry annually. $32 billion is what people spend to have sex with women and children. That's staggering. Pornography is actually $100 billion annually. $100 billion. Three times that amount. Pornography and porn industry is the largest form of sex trafficking. Let me give you three reasons why porn and sex trafficking are closely connected. The first is that porn demands, porn drives demand for human or sex trafficking. Porn drives that demand. This is the first way that the issue of pornography is connected to the issue of sex trafficking and the exploitation of women and children. It drives the demand. The supply of women and girls across the world, it's estimated a million people are being exploited at this very second. It's estimated 300,000 women and children are trafficked into the US every year. Why do those numbers exist? Because there's a demand for it. Because we buy it. We exploit it. We take it. We get gratified by it. Why do we do that? I don't think it's because we're wired to do that. I actually think we're groomed to that. We're groomed to consume it. This week when we were searching for videos to show before the sermon that would introduce the sermon. One of the videos that was recommended to us was a testimony of a former pastor by the name of Nate Larkin. He was a seminary graduate and pastoring a church, but somehow became addicted to pornography for 20 years that led to a life of brokenness and eventually to him finding himself on the streets with a prostitute. And this is what he said in this video. I was married with children, pastoring a church, when I found myself pulling to the side of the road to buy sex from a prostitute woman on the way to lead a candlelight service at my church on Christmas Eve. Porn took me places I never imagined. He would not have done that, but for the grooming, the cultivation of that desire in him. Listen, that's what porn does. It creates an appetite to use women and children in this way. And I want to stay here for a moment because this is important. Because if you in the back of your mind think that, oh, it's just a little porn. No one's affected by it. No one sees it. I'm not hurting another woman. Looking at porn is a lot better than going around sleeping, than sleeping with a bunch of other people. Let me say you're headed toward the path of destruction. Because how sin works, it will whet your appetite for a little bit more, for a little bit. And you enjoy that and you enjoy that and then sin will entice you with a little bit more. And you're going to one day find yourself doing things that you never imagined doing and being in places that you never imagined being. And you think and you, and you wonder how you got there is because you dabbled in a little bit and a little bit and eventually your life was destroyed. 
Look at all of these politicians and pastors or leaders that have resigned because they've been caught in affairs or sexual sin. Do you think they just woke up one day and decided that they're just going to commit sin? No. Started small. Started with maybe looking at a little porn, which led to something else. Maybe it led to a flirty conversation. And soon their sin destroyed their families, their careers, their churches, and the name of God was destroyed in their communities. Sin starts small, and if it isn't addressed right away, it will eventually overtake you. It will destroy you. One of the most gruesome passages in Scripture, it's actually one of my favorites, is Psalm 137, verse 9. And in this passage, the psalmist makes this statement. Blessed is the one who takes your babies and smashes them against the rocks. That's in the Bible? Yup. Someone that loves God wrote that? Yup. God allowed that to be in Scripture? Yup. You got to understand the context of what's going on. The person that was writing it was being held captive by the Babylonians. They had overtaken Israel. They had taken Israelites as slaves, and they're in captivity. And this person is reflecting and saying, they're too powerful for us now, but if we had destroyed them when they were younger, they never would have grown up and overtaken us. There is a lot of spiritual implications in that little verse. If you kill your sin before it is, grows up and matures, it will never overtake you. But if you allow that sin to indwell in your life and mature and grow, it will one day destroy your life. Kill the sin while it's still a baby. Kill the sin before you ever end up in a place where you will regret and you hurt the people around you. Flee from sexual immorality. There's a story in the Old Testament where God, through Samuel, tells Saul, the king, that you're going to go into a battle against the Amalekites. And when you fight this battle, what I want you to do is this. I will give you victory but I want you to kill every living thing of the Amalekites. I want you to kill their animals. I want you to kill their women. I want you to kill their children. I want you to kill their men. I want you to wipe them off the face of the planet. God's telling him this. Saul actually disobeys God. He actually saves a few of their men and keeps them as prisoners. And because of that and his disobedience, he loses the right to become king. David is now anointed king by God. And it's interesting because when you close out 1 Samuel, you find Saul in his final days. He's in a battle and he's losing. And he doesn't want to be taken captive by the enemy. So he falls on a sword and kills himself. But if you read 2 Samuel 1, David is walking in the midst of the battle and a person walks up to David and says, I just killed Saul. The person that makes that claim is an Amalekite. We don't know if he's the one that killed him or not. Maybe he found Saul lying there and ultimately killed him. But the person that takes credit for destroying Saul's life is the very person or group of people that God had years earlier said wipe them off the planet. Because of Saul's disobedience, the very people that should have been destroyed ended up destroying him. When God says flee, he does it for a good reason, flee. When God says fight, you fight. You obey God because God knows what's best for you. Porn drives demand for sex trafficking. Secondly, sex trafficking victims are used in the production of pornography. There are story after story that have been documented that says this. You don't know the story of every woman that you're looking at on that screen. You don't know their background. 
especially as you're looking at their images. You don't know why they're doing this. And because of that, you need to take caution. You need to take heed. Third, porn is a form of sex trafficking. Noel mentioned last week, but the definition of sex trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for the purpose of a commercial sex act. This is the day-in, day-out business of the porn industry. Shelley Lubin, whose testimony is on our notes page, makes the following statement about the porn industry. Women are lured in, coerced, forced to do sex acts that they never agreed to. Then they're given drugs and alcohol to help them get through these scenes. And she makes this following statement. The porn industry is modern-day slavery. This is the testimony of a woman that God rescued out of this industry. And this is what has been normalized. This is what has been sold to us as harmless fun. Let me say this to two, two, people, two groups of people in this room. Those of you who are struggling right now, and you're struggling because you have patterns of thoughts, behaviors, and consumptions that have been groomed and ingrained because of pain that you have gone through of things that have happened in your life. Let me say, God is with you. God is for you. If you are struggling with brokenness, no matter what it is, God is with you. And you don't have to find healing or comfort in pornography. God offers it to you. A bruised reed, he will not break. He's coming to you with open arms. And let me talk to you in this room who says, I don't see it, I don't get it, I don't care about it. We need to check ourselves. The people that are struggling in this industry, whether they're the women that are on the screen or the folks that are addicted, God cares about them and wants to redeem them. We need to have hearts broken against this injustice. We need to care about this, and it begins with us. We need to make sure that we don't objectify women as sex objects. We can't tolerate it, and it begins with our own lives because God has made every person unique as image bearers of himself. How do you fight this injustice? You do it by saying no to porn on a daily basis. That's how you fight it. You do it by saying no to looking at women lustfully. That's how you begin this fight. You say no to treating women and children as objects that satisfy your lust. That's how you fight injustice. That's where justice begins. Every one of us needs to check our hearts and choose simple acts of justice on a daily basis. It comes down to individual choices that we make on a daily basis. Let me jump right into the application process, application part. What do we do? We live in a society and the issue is so big. We're talking about an issue that is so much bigger than what we in this room can combat on our own. Porn's everywhere. What do we do? We live in a society pursuing a pure and undefiled life that demonstrates the love and purity and justice of our God every single day. That's what we do. Verse 18 sums it up perfectly. Flee from sexual immorality. And you know, we all heard about fleeing from sexual immorality. We've been taught that. But the reality is that the sin nature inside of us overcomes that, and we often find ourselves doing things we don't want to do. So we need a vision, an alternative vision, that we're not just running away from something, but we're running toward something. It's not just simply running away from sin. We need to run toward sin. Jesus. And we need to see a bigger vision of Jesus. 1 John 3.3 3 says that all of us who hope in Jesus purify ourselves even as Jesus is pure. Our hope is that he purifies us. We are pursuing the person of Jesus and his purity and his love and his righteousness and his justice every single day. We are captured by his love for us. That's why we never graduate from the cross. Because the cross demonstrates his great love for us. That's why we run back to it week in and week out, day in and day out, and say, God, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for redeeming me. Thank you for rescuing me. Thank you for setting me free. Thank you that you love me. We run to the cross. 
We're captured by Jesus. We get an image of a God who is willing to give his life so that we can be set free. Let me close by mentioning four, the same four things that Noel mentioned last week. Four attributes of a pure life that manifest the purity of Jesus. The first thing is prayer. This is where it starts. Prayer, someone says that prayer is what you do before you work. No. Prayer is the work. Victory and deliverance is God's reward for us. If you don't know how to pray, take baby steps. Make your prayer life real with God. Don't make it religious. Don't sit there and tell God what you think he needs to hear. Be open. Be honest with him. Talk to God openly and say, God, I'm struggling with this. Tell him that you're struggling. That's prayer. When you're lusting, ask God for help. When you're being lured toward that computer screen, ask God for wisdom to say no. Be open with him. He already knows. And he says you can cast your cares on him. Let me encourage you, go on a walk and talk to him. Don't just sit down and pray. But take a walk and just say, God, I need help on this area. And I'm not just talking about porn. Whatever you're struggling with, be open and honest with God about it. Talk to him. Use scripture when you pray. Grow in your prayer life. Grow to talk to God more. Asking him for help. Becoming dependent on him. Second, we need to understand. We need to understand God's will for us. And we also need to understand how the enemy works. Where is the enemy attacking you? Where are you vulnerable? You need understanding. Because without understanding, you're not going to win this battle. The Bible says that silver and gold and all these other riches are nothing in comparison to wisdom and understanding. So pursue understanding. The third thing we need is resolve. We need to resolve every day that we're going to serve God and put Him first in our lives no matter what. We do this in our house every morning. Before we leave, we gather the kids together. We get together in a circle. We pray for God's, number one, His protection on our lives, that when we're driving and the kids are at school, that God would protect us. But number two, we pray that we would honor God with our lives and our choices and that we would be kept from evil. We resolve and we ask God for help so that we would live for Him. See, the reality is that when we don't put God first, we put ourselves first. And when we put ourselves first, we will use other people to satisfy our desires and our wants. Finally, we need to engage. P-U-R-E. Pray, understand, resolve, engage. This is the pure life. We need to live lives of openness. Some of you are harboring secrets, and this morning the Holy Spirit is convicting you that the little point that you're dabbling in isn't okay. That if you don't address it, it will overtake you, it will destroy you. Some of you have been abused and hurt, and it's affected your life and your choices. Let me challenge you to find a safe place to open up and break the power of the secret. Maybe it's you coming to me and talking to me or one of the el other elders here at church. Maybe it's going to a Christian counselor that will help you walk through this. And if you need one, we've got recommendations on some really, really good ones. But you need to create help. You need to create openness. And guys, I may sound legalistic here, but you need to create openness in your digital world. That's where you're safe. This world that is created on our screens is created to create secrecy. And it's created to make us engaged in things that we ought not to be engaged in. There are a lot of good things on the internet, but there's also a lot of pearl that's out there. There's a great tool called Covenant Eyes that opens us up to accountability and let people you trust know what sites you're looking on, and where you're going online. And so I would recommend you get on that site, find someone that you trust that's not going to condemn you and judge you, but that will push you to pursue Jesus more than your own desires, and hold yourself accountable. Find people in your life to hold you accountable. 
Why do I say that? Because it enables you to keep no secrets. And that protects you from letting small sins from becoming big sins that eventually destroy your life. It enables you to live a life that is open, that is transparent, and that brings glory to God. Listen, this is personal for me. I've worked in an environment before where I'm at today where life was good till one day the owner was caught in a sexual act that was destroyed the entire business and in seconds. His marriage was destroyed. I lost a job because my income was dependent on him and I saw the devastation of sin. I've sat in churches where you're sitting where I've heard pastors confess that they had fallen into sin and they needed to step down and the churches were destroyed. It's important for me personally. It's important for you because there are people in your lives that will be affected if you don't take hard. Your spouses, your parents, your friends, this church, the name of Jesus, all of that is at stake. We speak this because we want you to live lives that honor Jesus. Not to condemn you, not to judge you. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But there is freedom and deliverance when you go to him and trust him. Every Sunday here at Loft, we end off by going back to the communion table. There's a reason we do that. We do this week in and week out. We go to the communion table because it reminds us that we aren't living perfect lives or good lives because of our abilities or our skills or our talents. That we're not here because we were good enough for God to accept. We go to the table because it reminds us that while we were still sinners, God sent his son to die for us. And so we run to the table every week saying, God, thank you for saving me. But at the same time, thank you that you're not done with me yet. And so this morning, we're going to go back to the table. But before we do, I'm going to ask you to examine your hearts, your attitudes, your affections, your desires. What in your life is secret that you know, if exposed, will destroy you? Would you run to Jesus? Ask him for help. And guys, while it sounds like I'm just hitting on the men in this room, you ladies, you know your hearts as well. Examine your hearts. If you're single in this room and you're a lady, realize that this could be something that's affecting the potential spouse that God will eventually bring to you. So you need to be praying for everyone, for your brothers, for your sisters. It affects all of us. This morning, as you examine your hearts, repent if you need to. Get help if you need to. Run to Jesus, who offers you grace, who offers you forgiveness who gives you the Holy Spirit to give you help. So as you do, whenever you're ready, you're welcome to come, grab the elements and come back to your seats. We've set up communion on both sides of the church. So wherever side you're on, you can go to your side and grab. And at the end, I'll come up and we'll partake of it together. For Father, this morning as we examine our hearts, would your Holy Spirit wash us new. Thank you that we are not defined by what we do. But this morning we sit here defined as sons and daughters of God. Forgiven, cleansed. And thank you that when we came to you, that you are a God who heals, who restores, who delivers. And so God, this morning we as a church say help. We need your help to live lives that exemplify Jesus in this pornified culture. We love you. In Jesus' name.